Hello again, everybody. We are at the very end of our last history and geography block of fourth grade. Can you believe it? And so we are done with making our maps. We've done the whole state of Oregon now. And we're going to go back and do one last bit of history before we close out this block. And this is the story of the bluebird. And you might be wondering what bluebirds have to do with Oregon history. And I'm going to tell you. Now, this is just an ordinary story that I found from Oregon's history. This is a story from mine and Isaac's family from Oregon's history. These people were not famous, but what they saw and what they experienced was a really good, just kind of cross section or a little sample of what Oregon was like during a really important time in our nation's history. And this takes place during a time called the Great Depression. And what the Great Depression was, was a time when the economy really crashed very badly. Banks closed everywhere and people lost all of their money. And at the same time, there was this big natural disaster that took place across all these states in the Midwest and it was called the Dust Bowl because the farmers there hadn't been taking proper care of the soil. They didn't know the right way to till it. And so the soil got so dry and all the nutrients were just drawn out of it by their crops that when the winds kicked up, all this dust would just blow away because that's what their soil had turned into. So all these farmers in the Midwest, where we grow a lot of our food, lost their farms and all of these people lost their jobs. And it was a really frightening time for a lot of people in America. But Oregon out here, we did okay during the Great Depression. We had our struggles for sure, and a lot of people lost their jobs and their livelihoods. But we had still really strong orchards and farms, especially here in the Rogue Valley. And a lot of people wound up moving from the Midwest out to Oregon or California or Washington during that time to seek a better life. And they found it here. And Many of them stayed. Both of my sets of grandparents moved to the West Coast during the Great Depression, and my family has been here ever since. So our story today starts in 1933 in a little tiny town called Alden, Minnesota. And I'm actually going to be reading tonight's story. Usually I try to tell it from memory for the most part, but I'm gonna read this one. Um, it's a little bit longer, so everybody settle in, get cozy, get a little blanket, snuggle up and this is my grandmother's story from when she was a teenager and her family moved from Alden, Minnesota to Medford, Oregon and it was during the Great Depression but they were a lot better off than a lot of families coming out here. She told the story to her son, my uncle Larry, in 1994 and she was about 80 years old then. And she grew up on a dairy farm in Alden, Minnesota, and her family did very well. They did not lose their farm like a lot of people did. The bank didn't take it away, but they chose to sell it. And she says, I don't know how long the folks had been planning, but that was the first we knew that they were going to sell the farm and move to a warmer climate for my mother who was not well. They had talked about moving west for years. So we had an auction. It must have been in December. I don't remember Christmas that year. Phyllis, that was her sister, my great auntie Phil. Phyllis might remember, but I don't. Sold the farm and all its contents. One day, here came dad driving down the road, a cold, windy January day, driving a new Chevrolet chassis. Chassis is like what you build a car on top of no cab or anything, he already had a plan for building the motorhome. It was made out of pressed wood like masonite, roof and all. He made a frame out of wood and built onto it, and it all fit onto the chassis. The neighbors thought he'd lost his mind. They'd come and look and say, Earl, what are you doing? It took about a month to build. 
He built it outside at Irvin's, that was their neighbor's. Since we'd already sold the farm and moved out, we lived at the neighbor's for six weeks, some with one, some with others. I lived at the Jensen's. Dad, Mom, Phyllis, and Bud, that was her brother, at the Irvin's. They planned furniture to take, a piano, a writing desk, a Maytag gasoline washing machine, a Coleman gas stove built into the cabinet by the front door. We had a portable oven to put on top of the Coleman. Underneath the stove, we stored all the pots and pans. Beside that cabinet, he built a cupboard with a door that let down to serve as a table. Over the writing desk, he built a cupboard that was one of the beds. Over the top of the piano was a bed. Over the washing machine was another one. My parents slept on a sleeper sofa. In the front, the cab was angled out on both sides. On the left of dad was a jump seat where my brother, who was 11, sat. And on the right of mom, who sat in a regular car seat, were two seats for my sister, 13 and a half, and I, 15. I had my 16th birthday on the way out. When it was all done, they painted it bluebird blue. That's where the name of our story comes from. That's the way mom wanted it and named it the Bluebird. And so it flew. On the first day of February, 1933, we had a little dog, a black and white terrier named Tag. We lost it in Ames, Iowa, when we visited Aunt Edith, my dad's sister, and Uncle Bert. We headed for the sunny south first. Also there, my dad's brother Charles and Aunt Hazel, Aunt Grace and Aunt Addie, my dad's unmarried sisters, and they had a boarding house for students. I later stayed with them when I was in college at Iowa State. Also my Aunt Sib and Uncle Roy. We stayed in Ames a day or two and then went to Council Bluffs, Iowa, where Dad was raised and visited Dad's brother Bill and family. We went to Kansas City, Missouri and stayed a couple days with Mom's uncle Dave Winter and Amanda. We stayed with another family. I can't remember their name since Uncle Dave only had an apartment. Her name was Eleanor, and they showed us the sights of Kansas City, Missouri. And that's where we saw the first bread line where they were serving bread and soup. So they would serve bread and soup to people who didn't have jobs and couldn't afford food. Uncle Dave was the neatest man, really a gentleman, quiet spoken, handsome, blackest hair. We stayed two or three days, went on to Richmond, Kansas, to visit their son Charles who had a tiny farm with one cow's milk. I remember that we had supper with them that night and went on the next day. We went on through western Kansas to Zenith to visit my grandmother's brother, Uncle John Hooten and their families. They had two sons who had families. We visited a long time, four to six weeks. Then we drove, as we drove along, the sand was piled up along the fences like snow in Minnesota, the days of the Dust Bowl. We had a great time at Uncle John and Aunt Minnie's. They had four children around there, a daughter with two kids in Stafford. One son lived at home and helped run the ranch. Another son, Floyd, his wife, Frances, had two children and they lived a few miles from there, Susie and a little boy. They were so cute. This was March, since we celebrated mom's and dad's birthdays they were both born March 30th, 1888. We always had two birthday cakes. I baked sponge cakes at Floyd's house. I ended up with four since I used their wood stove and they didn't bake. The damper wasn't closed, so heat went up the chimney instead of around the oven. So I mixed up two more and baked them. And we all got together at Uncle John's and celebrated their birthdays. We left the next week. We all hated to leave there. We had such a good time, but I bet they were glad to see us go. Oklahoma. I remember they were having floods in Oklahoma and folks were worried, but we did not have any problems. The soil was so red. We went through Oklahoma and there were oil wells all over. Our first sight of oil wells. We just kind of drove on through Oklahoma. I don't remember much, just pit stops and service stations. We stayed in Ardmore one night, just by an old rundown service station, but they had water, which was horrible. 
Then we were looking forward to seeing the blue bonnets of Texas. They were supposed to be blooming by that time, the 1st of April. I remember laughing at the blue bonnets because they looked like fields of vetch. Vetch are those purple flowers that grow on the hills around here. On to Mineral Wells, Texas, where we stayed several days, visited the once famous Crazy Water Crystals, a very small town with two very large hotels. They were tall. People came to partake of the Crazy Water Crystals for health. Sounds like lithium water. Our first introduction to the armadillo, a strange creature. The next destination was San Angelo, where we rested and cleaned up in a nice park, then on to San Antonio. We went through Austin and drove by the capital, but did not stay. We drove on to San Antonio, where we stayed for several weeks in Brackenridge Park, where there were several other families camped. We had a great time exploring the city, visiting all the historic sites, the Alamo for one, and having many good times at the park. Mom would play the piano and the campers would gather around for a song fest. I remember a game of rounding up snipes. Phyllis was told to hold the bag while we went out to round up the snipes. The game backfired because Phyllis caught on and she hid from us. We finally went back to camp after dark. We were worried and when she was found, we received a good lecture. My Annie Phil was a total troublemaker. I can still remember all the fresh fruit there was and the little man on the corner selling bananas. That's how he spelled it. 10 cents a dozen. The folks had planned to go to Long Beach, California to join other Alden friends, but the report of a severe earthquake there changed their plans. The folks loaded up with fruit and we headed back north, stopping in Osceola, Missouri. We visited the cemetery there where dad's sister Ethel and brother Ernest were buried among the yuccas growing tall with white, white blooms. Dad inquired around and we found our way out to the long place where dad was born. We took his picture sitting on the old cellar door. We wandered around the place and a small stream running through it. The house was still a part log house. We tried fishing from a bridge right in the middle of town. The next day, we drove on to El Dorado Springs where dad said he used to go with his sister Addie to get the special health water there. The folk had heard about strawberry, field around, strawberry fields around Joplin, Missouri. They stopped at the town square and dad inquired. He was told to go to the Bonner's place. We found it back in the hills in Scrub Oak. We were hired as a family to pick strawberries and we did until the crop was in. We had many a song fest there where we parked the bluebird right out in the woods. We heard and learned many Ozark songs. Dad was privileged to go on a coon hunt with the men and he really enjoyed that. We were on the road again and headed north and planned to take Highway 30 to Denver, but we stopped in Council Bluffs to spend the 4th of July with Uncle Bill. We then headed west. Nothing new until we stopped at a service station near the west end of Nebraska. The attendant told us to keep our eyes straight ahead and we would see our first mountain. Long Mountain. At first, it looked like a white cloud. As we drew near, it took the form of the mountain, our very first mountain. We had planned to go on to Denver, but there was a flash flood that washed out the highway. So we headed west by way of Ogden, Utah, and then to Brigham City. As we were leaving there, there was a large ripe cherry orchard ready to be picked. So dad stopped and asked if Mr. Anderson, the owner of the orchard, needed pickers. I sure do, he replied, so we all picked cherries. Mr. Anderson owned a creamery across the road from the cherry orchard, and the night before we planned to go on, the creamery burned to the ground, so Dad built a new one. During that time, the Andersons took us on our first mountain trip. We three kids and their two boys rode horses to the campground on Ben Lomond. By the time we got there, Mr. Anderson had a large skillet of sheep herders potatoes cooking. I don't remember what else we had, but I'll never forget those potatoes. They took us on a trip to Salt Lake City to attend the Tabernacle Choir concert. We made a trip to Promontory Point to see the spot where the Central and Southern Pacific Railroads joined. We left the next day and stopped the night and celebrated my 17th birthday at a stream in Utah, then on to Oregon by way of the Columbia River. 
we made several overnight stops along the way. One was at American Falls and the other at Crown Point near Troutdale, Oregon, where we, li where we kids laid on our stomachs and looked over the edge of the cliff to watch the train going far below. The folks said not a word and probably held their breath until we had moved back. We detoured Portland and drove down the Willamette Valley to Eugene, Roseburg, and Medford. Then they decided to go to the coast before settling down. So we went over to what is now Sunset Bay and camped along the beach. Not one house there then. We picked blackberries and caught weird looking fish from the rocks and thoroughly enjoyed the coast. We had to make a decision as to where to settle. It was harvest time in the Rogue Valley and the beautiful Siskiyou swayed us. Dad got a job on the Crater Lake Rim Road, so we moved up to bear camp below the rim and enjoyed real backwoods, bears and all. Wonderful spring water. When the snow began to fall, we moved back to Medford and moved into our first real home, 507 Hamilton Street, November 1st, 1933. With running water, lights, and gas, they paid $12.50 a month in rent. Phyllis and Bud started school at midterm and I waited until the following fall. We all loved the valley. Mom only lived two and a half years after that and I'm sure lived over many times that happy flight. Dad sold the house part of the Bluebird to Mrs. Brownlee, the woman re we rented the house from. She parked it in her back lot and rented it out. I don't know what she charged. So this is the story of my Grammy Beth and Isaac's great Grammy Beth and her family's 10 month journey from Minnesota to Oregon during the Great Depression and all of the hardships they saw along the way. Well, my Grammy and her family settled into Medford and they bought two acres with a house in East Medford on what is now Keene Drive. And her father lived in that house for the rest of his life. My auntie Phil married my uncle Melvin Nips. They lived in various places in the West and eventually returned to the Rogue Valley and they opened up a nursery, a plant nursery in Grants Pass. Mom's brother, sorry, I'm reading my uncle's words. My Grammy's brother, Bud, his real name was Richard, was a pilot in World War II, but he was killed in action in 1945. Grammy Beth graduated from Medford High School in 1936 and went to college and graduated as a registered nurse. She returned to Medford and worked at Sacred Heart Hospital and later the community and Rogue Valley Hospitals. She married my grandfather, Gordon Barker, in 1942. And after the war, they built a house next door to my great-grandparents. And my Grammy lived in the house until 1989. And she moved up to Woodburn for a little bit to be closer to her children. And eventually she moved back to the Rogue Valley in 1997 and bought a house and she lived there until she passed away at the age of 94 in 2011. And that is her story and how she experienced the Great Depression. And we happen to be living through an important time in American history right now. And I know that Mr. G is encouraging the eighth graders to write down a little bit of what they're experiencing and keep a journal. And you may do the same if you feel like that's something you want to do because you might just think you're just living your normal day-to-day -day life, but someday your kids might come to you and ask you what it was like to live through such a time as this. And even though it just seems normal to you, people might be interested to hear what you have to say. So I hope you enjoyed this story. I hope Isaac especially enjoyed this story about his great grandma. And I will see you guys next time.